Well, good evening. It is October 25th, 2023. And this is Sanctuary Lakeside Church's Wednesday evening devotional. So welcome. Glad you could join us this evening. Uh, we have a little bit different type of sermon uh, tonight than probably you're used to, but I'm hoping you'll find it interesting and helpful uh, as you move forward in your walk with Christ. And so uh, we're going to move right into our uh, first song, and then we'll be back for our prayer. So stay tuned. Well, it's that time of our service when we take our joys and concerns to the Lord in prayer. And uh, this evening, 
Um, we're going to really focus our prayers on the Middle East and the violence that is uh, seems to be escalating and uh, uh, the death toll that is rising and the number of families that are uh, being killed uh, along with military uh, personnel on both sides. And uh, so uh, there's a, just a lot of violence, a lot of hatred. We know how Jesus would feel about this. Uh, he would want them to get along and love and care for each other. Uh, that that doesn't seem to be a possibility right at this point anyway. So we're going to pray for peace uh, in the Middle East. Also, a number of people out there are having, uh, are recovering from procedures they've had done and some that are about to have them and others who are uh, facing end of life issues and things like that. So we're just going to lift up uh, a variety of, of issues this evening. And uh, we're just going to pray this from our hearts tonight uh, instead of going to one of the resources we sometimes use. Sometimes it's just good to have a nice conversation with God and, and to let him know what's heavy on our hearts and the joys that we're experiencing and and uh, just let him do what he does best and put his spirit to work on it. And then we need to just sit back and wait for the results. So uh, will you bow with me in prayer? Lord, there just seems to be so much violence in our world. Uh, the Middle East is flaring up again with an attack on Israel and then Israel retaliating against uh, Gaza and the Hamas people and and uh, the the people who are really suffering are the families the women and children the parents uh, the Palestinian people who really have nothing to do with this other than they just happen to live uh, in between two warring factions in our world. So we pray for safety for the innocents in, involved in this. Uh, we pray that for the military and governmental leaders that are responsible for, for this fighting, that they will work toward peace and to toward uh, reaching a, a, a stable peace that is not going to flare up every so often and cause more harm and hurting and death and sorrow. So, Lord, uh, we pray there. We pray for the violence in different countries in Africa. We pray for uh, the refugees in the Middle East and elsewhere that have been left homeless by this fighting and these wars and those who have been expelled from their countries for one reason or another. We pray for the aid workers that are trying to deliver food and medical supplies and clean water to the people in Gaza uh, who are, we, th we pray for the Egyptians that they'll continue to help this process, um, for the uh, peacemakers in Qatar and in the United Nations, that they will find ways forward to get aid to those who need it. So, Lord, we just lift up this area uh, especially. And, Lord, we still have people in our own country who are recovering from natural disasters, from earthquakes, from fires, from floods, from hurricanes, from tornadoes. And we're coming up on the winter, and we have some people that have been left homeless, some people that are are trying to rebuild their homes uh, following these devastating storms. And we just pray that you will uh, help them to find shelter, that you'll help them to be uh, have the resources they need to rebuild, and just to uh, bless them with your presence and the presence of those who seek to bring aid uh, and assistance to them as they start rebuilding. Uh, 
We pray for them and uh, for those who have lost loved ones in these disasters, that they will find a way forward under the shelter of your wings as they grieve their loss and try and put their lives back together. And Lord, we lift up those who are hurting in other ways, those who are recovering from different medical procedures, those who are waiting to undergo those procedures. We pray for those who are sick, those who have infirmities of the body, the mind, and the spirit, that you may bring comfort and healing to them and be with their family and their support systems as they uh, attempt to help them heal and bring comfort to them. Be with the medical personnel and the rehabilitation people and uh, the te x-ray technologists and the physical therapists and the nurses and the doctors and just all those people who seek to bring help uh, to those who need it so desperately. And Lord, we uh, lift up a prayer of thanksgiving for those many people who care for our sick and uh, are dying, for the hospice workers, and just for all those people who make it their daily job to bring comfort to the sick and to the hurting. We pray for our missionaries in far corners of the world, that they may be able to preach the, the message of peace that your son taught us as uh, he walked among us so many years ago. And Lord, uh, we thank you for Jesus, who loved us, who suffered and died for us, and then who rose from the grave to give us power over even death, just by turning our lives over to him. And who taught us these words to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to move on to our scripture here and then our message. So hang in there with us. Our scripture for this evening comes from the gospel according to Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 13 to 16. So Matthew 5, verses 13 to 16, and again, we're reading from the Living Bible. So, you are the world's seasoning to make it tolerable. Some versions of this say salt of the earth. If you lose your flavor, what will happen to the world? And you yourselves will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the world's light, a city on a hill, glowing in the night for all to see. Don't hide your light. Let it shine for all. Let your good deeds glow for all to see, so that they will praise your heavenly Father. These are the very words of God for the people of God, and your response is, thanks be to God. We're going to move on to our message. Hope you enjoy this. Well, we're going to talk this evening a little bit about success. This is uh, going to have a Christian bent to it, so hang in there. But the first part of it's going to be a little bit secular. But uh, I'll tie it together for you, so just bear with me. Success in general, we're going to discuss, and then success as God defines it. First of all, and this will be for our older listeners, does anyone remember who Ricky Henderson was? 
He was a baseball player who played for the Oakland A's in the 1980s. He has a lot of records in baseball, but probably the most famous is his record for the most stolen bases. In 1982, he stole 130 bases and shattered the previous record of 100 that he himself set the year before. Now, there are a couple things that you should know about this record. On his way to setting this record, he also shattered the record for being thrown out more times than anyone else in baseball. He was thrown out more times that year than many players even attempted to steal. He had set a goal to steal 160 bases that year, so he actually fell 30 bases short of his goal. So let me ask you for a second here. Did he fail? I mean, he goal set 160 he stole 130, and in doing so, shattered the record he set just the year before of 100. So he stole 30 more bases than he had the year before, but he didn't reach his goal of 160. So did he fail? Well, in terms of not reaching his goal, he did. Too often, we set goals uh, and don't quite get there and we feel like we failed instead of rejoicing that we got as far as we did. And so that's an important thing. Uh, he, uh, of course, he didn't fail. Uh, he stole more bases than anybody else in baseball. In doing so, he was thrown out more times trying to steal bases than most people even tried to steal that year. Um, well, so I think maybe you're getting the idea here. Uh, let's look at another baseball player, and it's somebody I'm sure you've heard of, even if you weren't able to see him play. Uh, that's the great Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth is best known for what? The candy bar, right? No, I'm kidding. Um, Babe Ruth is best known for, he, he held the record for the most home runs in one season until it was broken by a play, player by the name of Roger Maris. The year Babe Ruth hit 60 home runs, that was his record, he set another record. Anyone want to guess what that is? Think about the last example. The year that Babe Ruth hit 60 home runs, he set another record. And he, uh, that was he struck out more times in baseball than anyone else that year. Do you know what he said about that? Uh, as, as reporters were flocking around him to ask him about it, well, how he felt about this new record of, of home runs, one of them mentioned it. He said, uh, he said, you know, baby said it's a great accomplishment, but he said, uh, you can hit a home run, uh, hit more home runs than anybody else in baseball, but do you realize you also set a record for the most strikeouts in a season in your, on, on your route to 60 home runs? And Babe Ruth looked at him and he said, well, you can't hit a home run if you don't swing the bat. Now, Babe didn't have it easy in life. He was raised in an orphanage. It would have been easy for him to say, oh, I've had so many bad breaks. I'm just never going to make anything of myself. But he wasn't content to do that. So he set out to excel. And excel he did both at hitting the most home runs in history up to that point, and that record stood for a long time, and to setting the number, uh, the strikeout record for the number of strikeouts on his way to do that in one season. Uh, one more story, and then I'll move on a little bit. I remember a skier that I followed one year called Monique P 
Pelletier. She was a member of the United States Olympic ski team. In 1994, she qualified for the United States Olympic team. During a giant slalom run, she missed a gate. It was a mistake that in a race that is normally won and lost by hundredths of a second, cost her the race. But when she realized that she'd missed the gate, she climbed back up to the gate she missed and completed her run in next to last place. When she was asked why she did that when she had no hope of placing in the race, she said, I came here to finish, and that's just what I did. When she asked about her loss, uh, her championship attitude shone through, and she said, I'm one of the top skiers in the world. How can I feel bad about that? You see, it's not so much, I mean, the athleticism of these people is significant. They wouldn't have been able to be as successful as they were without it. But the number one thing is attitude. That's the common thread in all these stories. Now, let's take a look at someone who wasn't an athlete who excelled in life. Thomas Edison was the inventor of the light bulb, the incandescent light bulb. The ones we can't use anymore, by the way. <laughs> but uh, during his quest to invent this household device that everyone has had in their household at some point, um, he had over a thousand documented failures. Remember, this is a scientific experiment, so he gets the light bulb all ready, and, and he turns the power on, and it glows for a second and goes out. And he's like, hmm. And, uh, and so he moves on to the next, but he documents what he used for a filament in that bulb, uh, how much electricity he used, and uh, all the variables and then so that the next time he could try something different and see how that worked. How many of us would, at, at, when we flip that switch for the 599th time and the bulb br briefly glows and goes out, would, would have the fortitude to say, that's fantastic. We just learned another way not to make a light bulb. Yet, that's just what Edison did. And he tried, and he tried, and he tried, and he tried, until finally he succeeded. And it, and by the way, it, it wasn't until he looked at the problem differently that he was able to figure out what the problem was. You see, at first, he thought it was the material that he used for that little filament that went across between the two wires that came up into the bulb. And uh, he, one night, he sat there in his lab, and he was looking at that bulb and staring at that bulb. And he says, you know, to, he's talking to himself. And, of course, I'm just guessing, but this makes sense. And he's looking at it, and he goes, I don't understand it. It just keeps burning out, burning out. I, I got to figure this out. What's causing it to burn out? And so he probably took a look at at, at uh, combustion, burning, since it's burning out, and said, well, what do you need for combustion? Well, you need a, a source uh, or you need a, uh, something to uh, a source of energy. Uh, in the case of a campfire, it would be a match. In the case of a light bulb, it would be a battery or a, a plug into a wall outlet. You need a fuel source, which would be the filament in the light bulb. And you need air because a fire can't burn without air. And he went, air. 
I wonder if I pumped all the air out of that light bulb and then flipped it on if it would keep it from burning out. And guess what? It did. So after a thousand documented failures, he went on to create the first glass light bulb. Now, let's take a look at what it means to, uh, what it takes to make a successful person. First of all, uh, they have to be, have a positive can-do attitude. I know this hasn't worked for me real well up till now, but I know that if I stick with it and I look at this from different angles, that I'm going to be able to figure this out and I'm going to be successful. So a positive can-do attitude. Number two, they're goal-oriented. They didn't just wander around aimlessly. Edison didn't just keep flipping the power and changing the same filaments and, and doing uh, that. I mean, he tried new things. He tried different approaches to the problem. And, uh, okay, that didn't work. I've tried this, this, and this. Now I haven't tried this, so I'm going to try that. And they actually made a plan on how they were going to get from where they were to where they wanted to be. So that's a significant thing. Number three, they were willing to strive and never give up. Hooray, I just figured out another way not to be able to reach my goal. Guess I better figure out something else. And the... Uh, title of this sermon, I guess, should be Success Comes in Cans and Not Cannots. I have to believe in myself. I have to believe that I can accomplish this. Number four, they are willing to work tirelessly to achieve their goal, frequently putting in many hours to achieve whatever they're intending to accomplish. It was Edison that said, and I'm paraphrasing here because I don't remember the exact numbers, but Edison said, success, genius, in other words, is 5% inspiration and 95% perspiration. In other words, you can have the idea, but unless you're willing to put the work in to accomplish it, you're never going to get there. Uh, number five is they have to have faith that they can accomplish their goal. And uh, it's here that we're going to take a look at today's scriptures. Hezekiah followed these five traits that we just talked about in his life, as the scripture tells us, in every work that he began in the service of the house of God and in the law and in the commandments to seek his God, he did it with all his heart and he prospered. He knew that he had to work hard. He knew that he had to follow the rules and he knew that he had to seek God and work tirelessly uh, toward his goal in order to be successful. We could all learn from Hezekiah. The scripture from Matthew tells us that we shouldn't hide our light under a bushel. Do you know anybody that does that? Do you do that yourself? Maybe it's someone who is very talented and never uses it. What? Maybe it's somebody that doesn't even know what their talent is. Maybe you could help them find that. Maybe it's uh, uh, what good is a beautiful singer who never sings, or a wonderful actor who never acts, or a superior electrician who never picks up a wire in a wire cutter. Uh, are, are you going to let your light stay under a bushel? God needs you working for his kingdom. Or are you going to do as today's scripture tells us, in the same way your light must shine before people, uh, 
so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. Amen? Your challenge tonight is to find and acknowledge your greatest talent and to put it on that lampstand so that others will see the good things that you do so that they may want to do those good things too. Let that light shine to glorify God so that others will praise your Father in heaven, as the scripture says. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this inspiration of these great athletes and this great scientist. We pray that we will start to let our light shine among our fellow humans, that will set that lamp on that light stand and let it shine. Give us the strength, give us the courage, and if we don't have it yet, show us what our talent is, that we may use it for your glory. And it's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Well, it's uh, we're getting near our closing of our service. We're going to go into our final song, and then we'll be back for our benediction. The sun cannot compare to the glory of your love There is no shadow in your presence No mortal man would dare to stand before your throne Before the Holy One of Heaven it's only by your blood and it's only through your mercy Oh 
what's the least that I can do? Sacrifice of praise, offering of thanks and gratitude. Well, I hope you enjoyed this evening and that you uh, found our message interesting and hopefully enlightening. And maybe it'll help you get some of that direction you need for your life and maybe give you just a little boost in the right direction. So until we meet again next week, please receive this blessing. May the Lord watch between thee and me, while we are absent one from another. Remember, God loves you, and we love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. So until next week, may the Holy Spirit always light your path. Good night, and God bless.